Hello everyone, 2023 has been a bit of a wild ride for World of Warcraft fans. We started out the year with a roadmap, something we've never seen before from Blizzard, and a total of six, yes, six new patches, roughly eight weeks apart. Legion was famous for its 77 day release cycle, and Blizzard has managed to surpass that with a 56 day release cycle so far for Dragonflight. Of course, lots of releases doesn't mean much unless what's been released is actually good. So how did the 2023 patches stand up? First up was patch 10.0.5. The feature that got most attention in this patch was the trading post with its monthly cosmetic rewards and unique currency traders tender. Now, right from the start, some of the player base did notice some similarities with the premium stores and battle passes we often see in free-to-play games. But without being in a bit of an upswing, thanks to a very strong start to Dragonflight, most of us were happy to give it the benefit of the doubt and just enjoy. Sadly, that enjoyment and lunch was a bit marred with a bit of a buggy release where the post has to be shut down a couple of times due to missing rewards and purchases. Now, it's inevitable a game the size of WoW, it's going to have its bugs, especially when you... The team is speeding up releases the way they have. But honestly, I found it a bit surprising that they managed to release what was a headline feature for a patch in such a broken state. Fortunately, it didn't take them too long to get it all fixed up. By the middle of the year, the post did start to get some other feedback from players on the rising cost of the store items and worries around some data mined icons that were suggesting we could see Trader Tender in the in-game store. Game director Ian Hazikosis did try to put minds at rest, saying that the tenders would only appear in significant bundles, heavily hinting towards things like the new expansion release. Sadly, not long after that, we did get to see what significant bundles meant to Blizzard. It's fair to say this move confirmed a lot of players' fears, and since it's the release of the bundle, the feedback around pricing on the post has got a lot louder. Thankfully, we've recently had it confirmed that Blizzard don't plan to repeat these bundles in the near future, albeit without promising that they never would. Personally, for myself, I feel that this was an experiment that was probably a bit ill-judged, especially with the messaging around significant bundles and the way it came at a time when WoW and Blizzard are still really trying to rebuild lost player trust. I don't know if Ian knew about this bundle when he used the word significant, but at least at a corporate level, this doesn't inspire my trust, and I've really been less willing to engage with either the WoW store or the post ever since this has happened. Now, this wasn't the only thing that got released in this patch. We also saw the Storm's Fury public event, which took the PvP capture the flag system and applied it to a PvP in-game mechanic. Now, this event also used some new tech that meant that at least... When the event first released and lots of people were doing it, one could just turn up anytime and you'd be joining an event that was either just started or just about to start. Now, I really like that because one of the things I like least about many of the public events is the fixed start times. I very much prefer to be able to turn up and play the game in my own terms, having to do things like drop what I'm doing in-game to rush over to an event because it starts just isn't a play style I enjoy. Sadly, despite this tech, the event was only up for a few hours at a time, and this combined with what was, in my view, a fairly repetitive playstyle, meant it really ran out of steam quite quickly. I basically just collected the amounts I could get for the event and then never went back. Now, it's a shame that starting tech hasn't been seen in other events. I, I do wonder if maybe it was only possible because the event took place in a separate area from the main zones. But hopefully, you know... We'll see this return in future because I think it was a really good idea. We also got a few new holiday-related cosmetics, which was a bit of a sign of things to come for the game. Next up, Fury Incarnate, patch 10.07. This turned out to be the biggest minor patch we'd ever seen at the time, actually putting some major patches to shame. While we'd seen the Forbidden Reach in the pre-patch, until now it had been limited to being the Draxia starting area. With the new patch, it joined the open world and we effectively got a new zone and a minor patch. Imagine! The Reach was heavily based around rare farming. Now, I'm honestly not a massive fan of rares. It's back to that whole problem. 
I want to play the game on my own terms, turning up in this zone to find there's no rails I can interact with, just isn't fun for me. But the zone also gave us a daily hub with a rotating buff for the main renowned factions. So the question actually was pretty decent, in all honesty. The new public event evolved Storms, an expansion of the Temporal Primal Storms. Honestly, the Primal Storms have been the most meh of all the events for me. They're suitable, super rep they're super repetitive. And once I farmed them out, you know, you'll see a theme developing here. I just dropped off the event myself. Now, the big feature is the Scare Vaults build as a solo dungeon experience. Honestly, for me, it never really lived up to that building. I think the concept of opening doors to find puzzles, uh, to find bosses to kill, puzzles and treasures felt feel quite enticing, but in reality, a lack of challenge, lack of variation in experience, lack of roster rewards meant that for me, you know, it was just a bit repetitive. I also wasn't a fan of needing to farm rares for keys or its centerpiece reward being a powerful new ring, the Onyx Annulet. That brought back memories, honestly, of things like Torghast, Horrific Visions, the era of what I would call forced content. Thankfully, this time the Blizzard had a pretty high drop rate for the content, which meant it didn't really turn into the big grind. And this has also really been the only time in Dragonflight they flirted with this content. So hopefully they're continuing to learn the lesson that that just doesn't really work for the player base. Now, also in this patch, we got Orc and Human Heritage Armour and a bunch of new quest lines. Now, the Orc quest line was a real standout for me, perfectly capturing Orc culture and how the Orcs are trying to find new ways to fit into their home in Azeroth. And it very much deserved the positive reception it got. Now, the Human quest line didn't really quite match up to that, but honestly, it was a very high bar to follow. But it was still a really great quest line, continuing the story of Westfall and Vanessa Van Cleef, one of the best Cataclysm era zone storylines, in my opinion. And they also managed to reveal to the rest of the player base a bit of a secret that only rogues have known up to now. That is, unless, of course, you pay attention to lore insights like Wowhead. Now, we also got another cool side quest involving the Torrent, which actually managed to show them in a bit of a harder hitting light than this had been the norm since BFA. It was really nice to see Bane having an opportunity to go out there and kick some ass rather than just sitting with his back against a pillar, looking all broken and dejected for an entire patch, as he did in Shadowlands. And that was just the announced content. The team even found time to sneak in some secret content enabling access to some long removed cosmetics from Soul Grub. Now, patch 10.1.0 was the next major expansion labeled Embers of Notharian. And given the scale of 1007, really expectations were high here. And at launch, we got a much larger intro quest line than has been the norm for even major patches in my experience, and the welcome addition of some side quests to the zone. Now, while the campaign certainly stood up to what I'd look for in terms of size, and it's something I hope Blizzard will continue in the future, it wasn't super well executed with a fairly childish portrayal of Rathian and Sibelian's rivalry, and a narrative around the effects of Old God whispers on them that really just wasn't really told in game. I also felt that their decision to try and integrate the raid into the story narrative, especially uh, the discovery of a faceless one in the raid who most likely was the source of those whispers and our defeating them, releasing those whispers, kind of repeated a common issue of a lot of WoW campaign storyline where we've needed, you know, lore focused content creators to kind of explain what's going on for us. Now, I personally think that group content like raids and dungeons aren't the best way to tell stories. Even as a super low engaged player myself, the combination of social pressure, the desire to create, complete the instance content, get the rewards, really leaves me with no time to try and follow the story and I always miss what's going on inside it. I also felt this storyline came to a very strange conclusion where Alex Straza managed to completely ignore Farak flying around her domain, emulating Centre and Tusker. 
in, in favour of just revealing a new world tree to us. Now, content-wise, the Roar Zone was also very heavily based in rares, and immediately following the reach, I get the overall feeling that it didn't really land any better for the rest of the player base than it did for me. Overall, this format of rare fest mid-expansion patches kind of feels a bit stale, really just like a retread of the Timeless Isle, and hopefully Blizzard will put some work into moving away from it. In this case, it actually was a bit of a shame, because there was a bunch of like really innovative little rare mini-events, sniffing seeking puzzles, and a really cool snail racing daily set of quests, and... I really, really like those. It's just that, as a whole, it just didn't really come together into a coherent whole for me. Now, sadly, this type of innovation is very similar to a pattern we've seen since Zerith Mortis, which is it's not really backed up by depth and variety. So, be it the world quests, the events, sniffing seeking, they all start to repeat far too quickly. And that just means that, you know, it becomes really, really repetitive really too quickly. And I'd really like to see Blizzard start to take a little bit of investment into bulking out these features, giving them a deeper pool so that they can better harness that innovation that they are bringing to it. And we also got two world events. The first, the Farak Assaults, created a weekly quest hub with some of the rares and a reward twist. I personally found it was a reasonably decent event but you know that lack of variety again meant it really didn't land for me there was also the bigger event researchers under fire and this had a lot of potential in my view because it brought in a series of different events that needed to be completed within a timer now unfortunately a combination of the timer being kind of really hard to understand where it began and end and tuning that meant that the success or failure of the event really was down to how many players happened to join the event. You didn't even really felt like you had any agency in it. Basically, I very quickly learned to join a 40-man raid group, which would guarantee success. Now, combine this with the event only having two variations that alternated every week. And this really has been one of the weakest of the events I have seen, excluding the primal assaults. Now, to add insult to injury with this event, it had a bunch of issues in launch. I experienced events that wouldn't start up properly. At the start of week two, the rotation between the two different types of events didn't work properly. I, I never actually saw that second week version of the event until we got to week four, for example. Honest and... This was really at the time I started to have some questions about Blizzard's quality control. Just seeing these like major features coming out and just not really feeling that they've been fully tested and finished. Um, yeah. Now, we also got Season 2 with a brand new gear upgrade system which replaced the Mystic Plus only Valor system with a PvE-wide system. Now, where that system is a little bit complex to understand at first, it has turned out to be pretty transformative for end game rewards, taking the player power progression rewards to almost the best place we've ever seen in game. Almost. And I will come back to that later on. But this was really, really needed as I felt that the raid rewards have been largely broken since Shadowlands. I even gave it up raiding mid S3, not completely over the rewards, but it was a contributive factor. Now, combining that with a revamped Mythic Plus pool and you know, all the other traditional endgame PvE mods really, really turned out to be quite an enjoyable season. And Blizzard weren't slowing down. Patch 1.5, patch 10.1.5, Fractures on Time, bought us Time Rifts. A new public event, which while very much based in the Researchers Under Fire design, ended up being what I think was the best of all the public events. Based around time travel to six different alternate versions of Azeroth, the event had a rotation of six different mini-bosses. The lead-up to which was a series of timed activities, which had a very deep pull of activities to draw from and some clever use of RNG that meant really no, no two runs of this event actually felt the same. 
Add in a very extensive cosmetic reward pool, integrated currency that provided what's probably the best bad luck protection system I've ever seen in WoW, and a reputation grind for those of us who want to do those type of grinds, and this turned out to be a bit of a banger. Even some early issues, yep, more quality control issues with some very excessive lag, and some events where you couldn't even access the mini vest. Those didn't really dent my enthusiasm for it. Now, one thing I will say is that Blizzard, as with many of these cases, were characteristically uncommunicative about the issues until it was, I think it was actually a print interview with Ian, brought it up and got him to promise a fix was coming soon. That fix was duly delivered and made the event a lot better. But honestly, I don't think that was a really good look for the team. Most likely that fix had already been in progress for a while because, you know, video games take a ton of time to develop. But just the way it landed, I could see why a lot of players would look at that and just say, yeah, only get fixed because Ian was challenged. And that impression, honestly, they could have easily avoided that just by being more proactive up front in their communications. Now, the patch also included the Little Scales Daycare, a short daily quest sequence that rewarded a few pets and a nice toy. I think those events probably not to everyone's test, but I really enjoyed it as a bit of a change of scene. And we got another bunch of dailies related to time travel that added some cool little quirky lore snippets. There was also time for some more secret content with the opening up of old Scholomance and a crafting based restoration of Nexramus transmogs. And this time, these additions also included a cool new secret mount, Valiance. Now, the main headline of the patch, though, was the Mega Dungeon. Now, Blizzard always pulls something special out of their hats for Mega Dungeons, and this was no different. It wasn't quite at the heights of Mechagon, but I still really, really enjoyed the dungeon. Now, the end of the dungeon brought a bit of a narrative cinematics where the storm of seemingly forgot about his very confirmed belief that there was only one true timeline and showed no concern at all that Chromie had basically in the dungeon completely meddled and changed the timelines. Something which apparently has no consequences whatsoever. And they also got a very short storyline when Nozomo then tried to teach one of the infinites not to do that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, go figure. But, that, but at least Alex Straza actually managed to remember about Farak and realised that he was about to target the new world tree. He even remembered to tell us what the world tree was called. Now, I don't know why Alex Straza was the one to do that and not Marithra or Ysera, but there you go. In patch 10.17, Fury Incarnate, I had a really lot to live up to after 10.1. And as is often the case when you reach a peak, yeah, it turned out to be one of the weaker feeling patches of Dragonflight. The New World Event Dream Surges was just honestly a fairly limited, repetitive mob grind. Albeit, the reward system did follow the lessons that I'd learned from the time rush, and I was pleased to see them integrate that into the zone's world quests and also a, a bit of a gathering system, which actually meant you didn't actually have to do the event. There was alternatives to it, and I'd really like to see more of that in the game going, going forward. Now, the patch also bought us Night Elf and Forsaken Heritage armor and quests. Armor was really, really nice, and while the quest lines definitely were decent, they weren't really as exciting as the 1007 versions. Um, part of that, I think, especially with the Night Elf ones, was that they were having to avoid spoiling the upcoming Night Elf story in the next patches. Maybe if they'd have brought it in a little later, they could have gone a bit deeper there. But we also did get a really nice short quest line to get a new Minari Eridar skin colour and a quest line that set up a major reconciliation for some of the Draenei, and hopefully we'll see a continuation of that story soon. Now, on the main patch storyline, we did get a continuation of the long-running but very fragmented tier storyline series. Now, to be honest, the way they've delivered the individual chapters of these, which have been really small and spread out in a really weird way, I've been struggling to follow that story from one episode to another. Now, it's not the 
first time I've seen max level storyline spoiled by weird pacing. So this just seems to be a thing that WoW does. I'd really, really like to see the team work and actually improve in this stuff. Maybe get some good a good external editor in who can help them better understand when their pacing just goes off. Because I think part of the problem is the team know the story. They know where the story's going. It makes perfectly sense to them. But they don't experience it the way they, we do when it's so just weirdly broken up and time-gated. And we also did get a short continuation of the main campaign, which was decent, but really quite short compared to some of the other stuff. Now, overall, this patch in many ways felt a little bit like they were running out of steam. Now, I have a suspicion, though, that might be partly related to a less visible addition that we saw in this patch, which was the refreshes for Brewfest and Hallow's End, and also a new calendar event, Secrets of Azeroth. Now, combining that with the recent Calendar Cup and the Eastern Kingdom Cup that was also to be added to the calendar, and we actually experienced probably one of the most packed periods in the in-game calendar I ever recall. And I really enjoyed this, so I'm kind of happy to cut Blizzard a little bit of break. At the end of the day, all that work in the calendar stuff has to come from somewhere after all. It's just that it's not really as visible as being part of the patch because when you put it in the calendar, it gets a bit disconnected from it. Now, last up is the final patch of 2023, Guardians of the Dream, or 10.2.0. The new zone, the Emerald Dream, actually, I think, turned out to be a really well-designed zone that showed a distinct move away from the Rayfest model, and it's something that I think was really welcome. My only criticism is that I feel it's been a little bit sparse compared to pack the main patch stones we've come accustomed to um and we saw that same pattern of it just being a few world quests drawn from that very very shallow pool now i, I part of me almost wonders like perhaps blizzard were trying to react to the feedback they got in zara lake caverns and maybe just didn't really have time to find something to fill the gap from stripping out a lot of rares i don't know but certainly if i was given feedback to blizzard it's a nice zone, a lot of potential, but it does feel a little bit, you know, just lacking in terms of content. Now, the world event, the Super Bloom, was actually not too bad. As well as the Super Bloom itself, we got an Emerald friendly mob guide and a seed planting mechanic. Overall, I thought it was quite enjoyable as a weekly activity, but it just not quite enough to make me want to play it daily the way that I did with the time rifts. Now, story-wise, we saw a very welcome repeat of the bulky multi-chapter campaign and side quests. It's really great to see Blizzard leaning into this. I've always been uh, fairly disappointed by the scale of a lot of patch intros, and it, I really hope they'll continue to just get this bulk out. Now, the start of the story also, I felt, was much better executed than 10.1.0. But after the raid, sadly, it fell a bit off the rails with a deservedly criticised ending where the leaders of Azeroth just turn up out the blue, throw through Zach at Farak. Uh, really kind of strange with the character so heavily involved that it just suddenly feels really kind of, I don't know, undeserved, I guess would be the best way to describe it and at the end of the raid we do all the hard work while well, the aspects just look on and then they get rewarded by being elevated to their full as spectral powers god i i've never been a fan in superhero movies of describing special abilities as powers and oh the use of aspectral power it, it, it kind of grinds my gears a little bit honestly now, we also saw the end of the tier quest line, which was, well, odd. Tier, much venerated by the aspects, their greatest hope for survival against the incarnates. Even though in the Dragonflight book, the incarnates were apparently so afraid of Tear, they worried he'd, that he'd destroy them if they didn't do what he wanted, which, what he wanted was for them to put mind control juice in their children and to steal other dragons' eggs and do it to them too. And yet in this storyline, he ends up, well, 
sitting against a pillar, looking a bit depressed and bewildered at how much the world has changed. Honestly, it's really hard to believe this story was intended. And I do wonder if they'd maybe set up a thread around here and then just couldn't get the story to work and couldn't figure out how to finish it because it, it, it was just really, really strange. Now, max level gameplay, we got what, in my opinion, is turning out to be the best Mythic Plus dungeon rotation we've ever seen. An excellent raid and... On the rewards front, Blizzard took the few criticisms of their 1010 reward system and addressed them head on. They even managed to thread a needle between elite players' feedback of an overly fast progression system without managing to dial the system back to the point where it really impacted those of us mere mortals who do play it less intensely. Now, I said that the Season 2 system was almost the best, and the reason for that almost was this season's version. We now do have one of the best progression reward systems that I've ever seen in WoW. Hopefully, the team will learn the right lessons from it and we'll be able to build on it as we go into the next expansion. Now, overall, for me, 2023 has definitely been one of the better years in World of Warcraft. Dragonflight isn't going to reach the heights of another Wrath or Legion, there was a point back around 915 when I thought that might be possible, but that feeling of running out of steam. And also, honestly, that patch 10.2.0, I I kind of wish that it had been closer to, say, a 8.2.0 or a 7.3.0, one of those really epic mid-expansions that they pulled off in the past. If they'd have done that, they could have pushed it over the line, but sadly, you know... They didn't quite manage it. But that eight-week patch cadence, new patches arrive in the PTR basically the week after the predecessor patch launches. There's been news and something to look forward to every week and wow, and I have really enjoyed that. Those faster patches have also meant that the team have had opportunities to fill gaps in content. Like I honestly think that season two and 1010 would have been much worse if they hadn't been able to get 10.1.5 out when they did, for example. Now, in the now in the add in the continuation of a new design philosophy, which has completely moved away from that feeling of us being forced to play, and at least and we which and it we and at least as many highlights as has been lowlights. And you know, for those of us still playing, it's been a fun year. Now, I'm not so sure it's enough to bring laps players back, although I think we are seeing some signs of folks starting to drift back now, thanks to the BlizzCon hype. But to really seal the deal, I think the team do need to focus on adding a bit more depth on top of the innovation they're putting into world content. And on the narrative front, honestly, I think they just need to slow down the pace of the story. Ever since Shadowlands, I've really had this feeling of great stories trying to get out but ultimately being spoiled by just a kind of rush, rush, rush with no time for the writers to invest enough and properly motivating their characters and setting things up. So hopefully that's something they will be able to work on and change, especially in the new, new expansion. Now on that latter point, there's been a bunch of really great stories and side quests. Blue Dragonflight campaign quests, the Orc Heritage, were real standout examples of that. So it's obvious the team do have the right and chops to pull off good storylines. It just needs, you know, a bit more better editing, some more creative leadership. Hopefully Metzen's return will provide for that. Now, WoW is still in recovery mode, honestly, from the design issues of Shadowlands, but that recovery is now well underway, and we've got a new roadmap for 2024 that's recently been released. So it doesn't look like what is going to be a new expansion year is going to have any of the kind of content drought we've seen in the past. But that's a whole other video, I think. Now, if you're wondering if this is the time to return to WoW, if you left due to the borrowed power, forced content, or RNG of the BFA Shadowlands area, I think the answer is a very strong yes. Dragonflight has just stripped away all that stuff, and while it's a bit more of a slimmed down experience, there's a lot to like in the game. I think if you've been away for a little bit longer, it's not 
quite so clear cut. But honestly, yeah, I'd say if you've got the cash for the game, I would jump in, give it a try. You might be per pleasantly surprised. And I'm super interested to know what were your highlights and lowlights of the last year? Are you excited for the coming year in the world within? Do comment below. And if you enjoyed this video, I'm going to be working on a bunch of other cool new content in the coming year. So hit that like button, hit the subscribe button. All of that stuff really helps to boost the channels and it'll help to make sure that I'll be able to keep producing this type of content. But with that, I'll say a very firm goodbye to y'all and thanks for dropping by.